Hey everyone, Mike here. Competition is heating up. I've got all the latest details on the Kuiper Satellite Constellation, the latest contender for global satellite internet dominance, including how it compares to SpaceX's Starlink. Coming up. On July 30th, the FCC authorized Amazon's Kuiper project to operate over 3,000 satellites in low Earth orbit, providing satellite internet to the world. Most of my videos, I focus on SpaceX's Starlink internet constellation, so I thought it'd be interesting to dig into the Kuiper project to understand a bit more about how it works. All the details I'm going over in this video, there are references down below in the description. While you're down there, click the like button if you're getting value from this video. It really helps this channel to grow. I'll go through the official details from the Amazon announcement and the FCC authorization. But stick around after that. I've also dug a bit deeper to find a few more tidbits of information that aren't being widely discussed and that aren't mentioned in the official documentation. So stick around for that. First, let's talk money. In the Amazon announcement, they say they'll spend over $10 billion deploying and operating this satellite constellation. That is pretty much spot on what SpaceX has said Starlink will cost. In 2018, Gwen Shotwell said that they were expecting to spend $10 billion or more uh, on the Starlink constellation. I don't know if there's something special about this 10 billion or if it's just a nice round number to throw out. Maybe it means kind of greater than 10 billion, but not quite 20 billion. I'm not sure. Amazon is a publicly traded company though, so it might be interesting to see if we get a bit more detail into how their money is being spent to get a better idea of how much these internet constellations cost and where the biggest expenses lie. Okay, now let's take a look at some of the technical specifications. In terms of spectrum and frequencies, SpaceX is initially launching its satellite constellation using the KU band. So around 10 to say 14, 15 gigahertz. The Kuiper authorization from the SEC is the KA band. So that varies from around 14 all the way up to potentially 30 gigahertz. The official FCC authorization goes into very specific details on the frequency bands that will be in use. So check that out again in the description below if you want to get the exact specific frequencies in use. But generally, Starlink is starting in the KU band and adding the KA band plus some others whereas Kuiper is uh, focusing initially, or at least in this filing, just on the KA band. In terms of numbers, Project Kuiper is authorized by the FCC for 3,236 satellites. Starlink has gone through a couple changes. Their initial authorization was for 4,425. Their most recent authorization which was when they dropped that first shell down to 550 kilometers, was for 4,409 satellites. And the most recent request drops that by one to 4,408 satellites. Now those satellites are arranged in different configurations, different shells of satellites at different altitudes. For Starlink, it's a little bit confusing because they keep changing their mind on how best to deploy these satellites, which is very typical of SpaceX and Starlink, rapid iteration to get better results. So in their initial filing, so this was the 4,425 satellites, they were all up around 1,000 kilometers. I think it was 1,100 was kind of the, uh, the typical range and they applied and were approved or authorized by the FCC for the first change, which was to bring the first shell down to 550 kilometers. 
This is actually what they're deploying right now. So all of these Starlink satellites deployed right now are settling in at 550 kilometers. They've also applied, but it has not been approved yet for to basically move all of their satellites down to a similar uh, altitude uh, from 540 kilometers up to 570 kilometers. A big advantage here, so obviously closer to Earth means faster latency, but they've also rearranged the inclinations so that the last few uh, shells, I guess, actually have a very steep inclination, which will bring service over the polar regions, north and south. So for the United States, this is a big deal because it's the only way they will get coverage over Alaska. This first shell that Starlink is launching only is going to cover the continental United States, even when it's completely finished. So getting those higher inclinations to get over the poles is a big advantage. So a lot of the other satellite internet companies are uh, protesting this change, including Kuiper. But my feeling is that the FCC is going to approve this because it's the first option that would get the earliest coverage for Alaska. The Kuiper constellation has their uh, satellites arranged in three shells. So one at 590 kilometers, 610 kilometers for the second, and the last at 630 kilometers. So these are a little bit higher than the Starlink shells, but not significantly. With the Kuiper orientation, they're going to have coverage from 56 degrees north to south. So again, that's all of the continental United States. And what they say is that, that will be continuous coverage worldwide within those latitudes, but no polar coverage, at least in this authorization. So I think that gives a big advantage to SpaceX and Starlink, atop of some of the other things that we'll mention as well. For users of the system, we have the actual user terminals on the ground. For the Kuiper project, we don't have a lot of details here. There's no official details on the, the user terminals, but stick around till the end of this video. I dug a little bit deeper and I do have some information on the user terminals that I'll share in, in just a minute. On the Starlink side, we know quite a bit about the user terminals and definitely check out some of my other videos for photos of the user terminals and a lot of details on how they're going to be set up and how they're going to operate. We also now have an FCC filing from SpaceX on the user terminals where they reveal that they have so much interest. They say over 700,000 signups on Starlink.com, which if you haven't signed up, go do it. 700,000 signups in the first few days representing signups from all 50 states. And if you recall, they had an initial authorization for 1 million user terminals. So effectively, 1 million customers in the United States. And based on this surge of interest, these 700,000 interested uh, users, they're now asking the FCC to increase the allocation to 5 million user terminals. So for anybody waiting on the beta, this is huge news that SpaceX is really pushing hard to get this rolled out as widely as possible. So 5 million user terminals is a huge jump. Now that we know that there's so much interest, these 700,000 people who've signed up for the service just from the United States, I'm really interested to know how much you would actually be willing to pay for the service. We've had some hints from Gwen Shotwell that maybe the service will be around $80 a month, not guaranteed for sure, but let's say it's $80 a month. Would you pay that? How much would you pay? And tell me what you're paying now in the comments down below. I'd love to get an idea of the difference between, you know, some of the pretty crap service that people are paying now, how much that costs versus how much they'd be willing to pay for Starlink. So let me know in the comments. So the official details are really interesting, but there were still some big gaps, things that we don't know about the Kuiper system. I wanted to try to find out a bit more, so I went digging a bit and found some really juicy tidbits. 
As part of the official Kuiper announcement, Amazon also published around 100 job postings for the new project. I went through and read every single one of them to see if I could find any interesting tidbits that would shed a bit more detail on how the project's going to look and how they're going to take it forward. Just from the breadth of the job descriptions, it's very clear to me that Amazon is intending to build their own satellites and their own user terminals. The variety of job descriptions, everything from uh, subsystem engineers, RF system engineers, battery pack engineers, antenna engineers, it's very clear that their intent is to build the whole thing themselves. This includes job descriptions for very detailed uh, components of the user terminals, the structure, the assembly, the PCB, the antenna, right up to metallurgy and materials for the satellites themselves. It's also clear from the antenna system postings that their intent is to use phased array antennas, similar to Starlink, on both the satellite component and the user terminal component. So from that, we have a very strong indication that the overall operation of the system is going to be relatively similar to what we're getting from Starlink. It will likely be a phased array, stationary flat panel in the user premises, up on the roof somewhere, and on the satellite, a phased array providing steerable beams uh, from the satellite down to Earth. One very interesting detail to me was in a posting for, uh, and let me make sure I get this right, the principal technical program manager for satellite networking and telecom services. And this was notable to me because it was the only job description that called out that experience with AWS was desirable. Now, if you're not familiar, Amazon has a huge division called Amazon Web Services, where they take everything that they have learned about running Amazon retail business and all their other divisions, and they package these into services that they make available to other companies to build their own applications and their own infrastructure. And if you don't know about it, you might be surprised that most of the biggest sites on the internet actually run on Amazon Web Services using their hardware, their networking, their infrastructure. And they pay Amazon a fee based on their usage. So what I found particularly interesting here is AWS has a bit of a history starting at least to work with telecom carriers with their AWS Wavelength service. And what that is, is instead of running your infrastructure and your code and your applications in AWS's data centers, which is the normal way you use AWS, they've actually now got a service, AWS Wavelength, where you can take your code and your application and actually run it and execute it at the very edge of 5G networks. So the idea is you can move your computation, your storage, your data closer to your end users. And the idea is the closer you can get, the lower, the lower, the lowest latency you can get. So really as fast as 5G can move packets back and forth, there's no additional network traffic. It's hitting your server, running right in that telecom operator network closet, if you will, and then right back out to the user. So extremely small latency. And this system is integrated with the rest of AWS. Now, I love AWS. I'm a huge user of AWS in my day job and in my personal projects. So the thing that made me particularly interested here is the idea that Amazon might take their Kuiper project and incorporate that in their AWS infrastructure. So the idea being that maybe there would be opportunities to actually take your compute, your, your application, and integrate it more closely with these satellite systems. So two big use cases that I'm interested in is, will this provide, in a sense, a private network can you extend your virtual private cloud? That's Amazon's network, uh, like a software-defined networking. Will they provide a method to extend that through the satellite network 
so that you can have a private network from a remote location up through the satellites of the Kuiper constellation and directly in to an AWS data center where you can talk to your own application. That would be very cool. And the second, and I think even more compelling, is the idea that potentially some of the AWS infrastructure could actually run within the satellite constellation itself. Now, obviously there's definitely resource constraints, but Amazon also has, or I should say, they already have a lot of experience running their CDN CloudFront, which is a content distribution network that runs very close to end users. And this acts as a cache so that you can keep files very close to your users, particularly static assets. And they even have the capability of running application code in these remote data center points uh, with what they call Lambda, which is their kind of code or function as a service, Lambda at Edge, which is a slightly constrained environment, but it allows you to run custom code very close to your end users. Now imagine if you could run custom code and host static content actually in satellites in orbit, you would pretty much have the lowest possible latency to even the most remote areas on Earth, from the user terminal up to the satellite where processing could be done, static files retrieved, and served directly back down with no additional round trip to a data center or boat onto the internet. I don't know for sure if they're doing this, but if they are, that is very compelling and might open up a whole slew of new ideas and new, I guess, capability that didn't exist before. So I'm watching that very closely, uh, very exciting. I'm really curious to see how that develops. One other interesting aspect is that there's no guarantee that Amazon's Project Kuiper is going to launch their satellites using Jeff Bezos' other company, Blue Origin. Obviously, that would be a good match, but they are two separate companies. Blue Origin is not owned by Amazon in the way that Kuiper is. So that means we might have a situation where, for cost reasons, it could come out that Project Kuiper might be launching their satellites using potentially SpaceX as a launch provider. Now, clearly there's some competition there in terms of Starlink, both owned companies of, of SpaceX and Amazon. So that competition alone might exclude them, but it's just very interesting to see that uh, who's going to launch these satellites is still really unknown at this point. So these are exciting times. If you wanna get all my updates as soon as they come out, subscribe to the channel down below and hit the bell icon so you get notified as soon as new videos come out. I'm really excited about what's going on in this space. Thank you everyone for watching. See you next time.